Uh, sometimes uh, people ask me uh, uh, what I am or what I do or something. And uh, sometimes I say I'm an Apple historian for lack of better other descriptor. But other times I say that I'm a fruit explorer. And, uh, and tonight I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, fruit exploring and being a fruit explorer. I'll talk about other things too, but that's going to be where I begin. Um, Americans uh, love a good mystery, and I'm no different than uh, most other Americans in that regard. And uh, whether it's in the movies or cheap fiction or whatever it is. And, uh, um, the, the first time, and, and the, so the, the sort of transition or, the, or the, uh, the how you can have uh, a mystery like, you know, who done it, and then an apple, um, it, it all goes back to as far into the past as I think that there have been people and there have been fruit when there have been people out there looking for uh, better fruit, different fruit, sweeter fruit, more bitter fruit, whatever, something that they want. And those people we call fruit explorers. And, uh, and there are famous fruit explorers. Many of them went to Asia uh, from America. Many of them came to America from Europe to collect plants and bring them back to wherever it was that they lived, whether they were going from west to east or east to west or whatever. And uh, the first time that I heard the term fruit explorer was uh, about maybe 35 years ago, 40 years ago, something like that, when um, I had been uh, spending time getting uh, very curious about the old trees uh, in Waldo County and Kennebec County. I live in Palermo. And, uh, and I knew, came there knowing, knowing nothing about uh, really agriculture, or certainly I knew nothing about apples. And, uh, but I became very interested in the old trees that were still everywhere to be found uh, all around town. And the fruit at that point was basically not being used by anyone. They were uh, just dropping on the ground. Because as you know, uh, that generation would be our parents' generation had uh, pretty much left the farm and were working off farm either in Augusta or maybe BIW or wherever. But many people were not farming any longer. The trees were basically had been abandoned. So I was, uh, got curious about these old trees and, and started to learn about them. And I'll tell you more about that later on in the talk. But, um, but somebody told me about a magazine. And the magazine was this little magazine here called Pomona. And um, it was put out by a group called the North American Fruit Explorers. And the magazine Pomona came out for quite a few years, about 30 or 40 years or so. And it started out as, as a round robin letter. And so uh, this was back, of course, way before the internet. And, uh, and so the way that it first worked was these different fruit explorers would write a letter and then they'd send it to the next person. You can imagine when you get, by the time they wrote the letter and send it, you've gotten 70 emails now. But, um, but they sent this letter and they would send it to Bob and Bob would then write something on it. What was Bob's experiences? And then Bob would send it to Jane and Jane would write on her experiences and so forth. And it went around and around and around and people shared their fruit exploring adventures, what they were discovering and so forth. But then, uh, and then they got really more sophisticated and they decided to actually make a magazine. So they made this magazine, which they called Pomona. It's a very no frills magazine. It's typed and uh, no ads, no, no graphics, no photos, nothing. And uh, this is, uh, I'm just going to read you uh, two paragraphs here from one of the first issues. And I'm going to pick it up in the middle and you're going to have to guess what he was talking about earlier. <laughs> 
This brings to mind the large number of very old apple trees we see even now. This is in the late 70s. Some are giants, some only rotten trunks with a branch or two in leaf. These old loners may be seedlings or any number of old time favorites, which had high popularity locally or countrywide a century or more ago. They are still around in yards and old homes, in fields, along roadsides or riverbanks, in patches of brush, woods, or on hillsides. The old loners and fields we see at blossom time when the foliage of the surrounding trees is a light green compared to the cloud of pink white blossom from the apple trees. Most of these old trees never seem to bear fruit. But if we graft to our own trees and identify the fruit, we may save some old variety thought to be out of existence, to be of interest to the amateur. If these old loners were planted by someone years ago or trained and cared for at one time, they must have been of some value. In a way, it's like putting your hand into a grab bag where the presents were wrapped a hundred or more years ago. There's no telling what you may pull out. Now, as I got more into this, then I uh, started this catalog, and some of you know about it, maybe most of you know about it, Fedco Trees. And I did that because I felt like uh, people were not planting many trees anymore. And, uh, and I really felt like that was something that we needed to be doing. It was very important that we continue to plant trees. And the way that I looked at it was this, that, that uh, the trees that I was falling in love with around Palermo and Liberty, Freedom, and up further afield, um, they were not planted by me, obviously. These were very old. They were hollow, like this tree that this person was just talking about, broken down, hollow, couple of branches left alive, but still fruiting. And um, they were planted, they were grafted, and we'll talk about grafting, um, 100 years earlier, or maybe 200 years earlier. And, and they, were done, they, were, they were grafted for me. And, um, and I say that sort of jokingly or with a smile on my face, but it's really true. And the same are, is true for the old trees that have entered into your life, that these were done for you. And they were done for, in this case, me, um, by people that never knew me, never would know me, never knew I was going to exist, weren't related to me in any way, but still they had done it for me. They were a gift from an anonymous grafter of the past. And I got thinking about that as like a, a, uh, a, a relay race in which, in which something was from the past to me in the center. And what was I going to do with it? Was I going to take that and then pass it on to the future? Or was I going to take the baton, so to speak, and just let it drop and let it end there? I should say a little bit about grafting now before I go on. I don't like to do that right so soon, but I will. When you plant an apple seed, say a Macintosh seed, it will produce a tree if you take care of it, and the tree will produce fruit, but the fruit will not be Macintosh. And um, I know that some of you know this, some of you may not know this, but not only that, but if you plant a thousand Macintosh seeds, they will all, you know, if they're taken care of, they'll all grow to produce fruit. There'll be an apple tree. But none of them will be Macintosh. And none of them will be anything else that's ever been before. And none of them will be uh, any, they'll never be, the, they won't be the same as one another either. Every one will be unique. Every seed unique. This is absolutely key to the history of apples in Dresden or in any place. Without that one piece, there would be no history of apples. It would be completely different. So we must remember every seed unique. 
So the way that apples work is, is the flower cannot receive pollen from the same variety. So if you had 100 Macintosh trees in your orchard and no other apples anywhere around, that you would get no fruit. Because, because even if you've got many Macintosh trees, they can't pollinate themselves. So, so um, now, how do you then replicate a Macintosh? The way that you, the way that you, you replicate it is by grafting. And when you graft, and I'm sure some people here have done some grafting, but when you graft, you take a very tiny twig from the tree you wish to replicate, in this case the Macintosh, about the size of, of my pen top, about that big, just a little piece, a little twig. And you splice it onto a tree, onto an apple tree with roots. That is the graft. And you do it with a very sharp knife. You put a little piece of tape around it. And from that junction on, it will replicate the Macintosh or whatever else it is that you want to, you want to replicate. So going back, to, going back to my little analogy about relay racing, um, the, this, the little piece, the little twig, which is called the scion, S-C-I-O-N, the scion is like the baton. And, and in the relay race, you know, they come running up to me and they, hand, they, they stretch out their hand and they hand me the baton and I take the baton, or maybe it's the scion, and then I graft it onto a new tree, onto a young tree, and it goes off into the future. And, and that, to me, was, thinking of it in those terms, was uh, one of the important inspirations, we'll say, that, that got me to want to track down these rare old varieties like that fellow in the Pomona, track them down, graft them, and preserve them for people in the future who would not have any idea who I was or even care. Now, as I got into this, um, I started to, uh, you know, I started this catalog, and then I started to uh, 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 do a display at Common Ground Fair when it was up in Windsor. And um, there was an old man, he's still alive, he's an orchardist, and he lives in Mercer. His name is Francis Fenton. He is going to be 100 on July 17th next year, and he's still running his orchard. And um, and he has many, many varieties. He was one of my early mentors who taught me about these old varieties because there was you know, uh, much to learn and, and the people that taught me the most were the very older, many older people, most of whom are not, are not alive any longer. And uh, at a, one of the first common ground fairs that was in Windsor, Francis had had a display and it was a, uh, it was a rack about maybe about as big as this uh, door here, or about that high, on an angle. And he had nails sticking out of it, about 20 nails, 30 nails. And he had taken apples of different varieties and shoved them onto the nails. So they were like floating on the board. And then he had the names underneath them. And he stood there and he loves to talk. He still loves to talk at age 99. And, um, and then he just talked about the apples on the display. And I remembered that and some years later, probably, I don't know, five or 10 years later, he was no longer doing it there. So I decided I would do a display at the fair. And, um, and that was a great thing to do because that really helped with my fruit exploring. People would see the display, it's like a magnet, they'd come in and they'd want to tell me about some apple that they had uh, discovered or was in their family or they really wanted me to see or eat or identify or something. And one of those people uh, was a man named Len Alexander. And, um, and Len lived in Chelsea, and, um, um, but he grew up in Dresden and he grew up on the Alexander Road. And, uh, and he was uh, just, I don't know if anybody here knew him. Some of you must know Bruce, who's his brother, and maybe you know other relatives of his. But he was just a totally wonderful, delightful, funny, fun guy. And every year he'd show up at the fair, and he was fairly old. He, he, is, he died a couple of years ago. And, um, and he was missing most of his teeth. 
but he would come in and he would just stay at, at our booth for an hour and just talk to people and rant and rave and bring fruit for us to taste and it was just great. So one day, um, he invited me to come over to his place in Chelsea, so I went. And, uh, and he showed me all around, gave me a bunch of different fruit to try. Because he was a real, he also was really into old automobiles, but he was really into fruit. And he had all kinds of really interesting old varieties. And so he told me this story. So when, when he was young, and I think at that point he was living in Chelsea, though it might have been down here in Dresden, I'm not sure. Um, but I think it was in Chelsea. Um, he and his father used to go fruit exploring. And what they would do is they would go uh, along the river, along the Kennebec, to the old farms that used to be along the Kennebec but had been abandoned. And uh, they would look for, you know, and the trees, the trees are, are you know, they, they often will live to be 200, so they outlive the farms. You know, the farms disappear into the earth and the trees are still there, I like to say, waiting, waiting patiently for somebody to come along and care again. And, uh, and one of them uh, was, uh, was there one day when, uh, when uh, Len and his dad showed up and, uh, and it had big, beautiful red fruit on it. And so they picked a bunch of the fruit, brought it home and loved it and decided that like I do frequently, that's what all this is about and that's what grafting's all about. They went back the following winter to get some cyan wood, some of those twigs, to graft this big red apple at their farm in Chelsea. So, um, so they did, and they grafted a tree, and, uh, and the tree grew and thrived and, and produced these big <coughs> red apples. And, um, and, but it needed a name. And, um, and they didn't know what its real name was. And, um, and just parenthetically, um, as a fruit explorer, as, a, as an apple fruit explorer, we'll say, there's many, there's many kinds of fruit explorers, but we'll say an apple fruit explorer. Sometimes I have an apple, like this one, and I'm looking for a name, right? So it's, it works two ways. So sometimes, or maybe if you're Sherlock Holmes, sometimes you have the clue, you have the object, but you're trying to wonder how it fits into the mystery. And other times you have a clue, but you're trying to find the object. But anyway, sometimes you have the apple, but you don't have the name. And sometimes you have the name, but you don't have the apple. So, so it works both ways. And, um, and uh, many, of, uh, many of the apples that I've found over the years, and quite a few of them are on here, um, uh, in fact, I should just say, these are 16 apples, one that originated in each, in each county in Maine. So all over in Maine, there were these, uh, these seedlings coming up. People were planting seedling orchards early on, and then they were picking out the best ones, the ones that kept, the ones that made a good pie or good cider or good sauce or good butter, cake, bread, whatever, and then naming them. So... Often I'll find a variety, and I know it's an old variety because the tree is this big around, it's hollow. Sometimes you can even see the graph line 100 years later, 200 years later, you can still see the graph line. So I know it's an old variety, but I don't know the name, so, so I'll just give it a name. I've got to do something. I'm not going to call it, you know, I don't know what, number 10 or something. So I'll name it after the road that I found it on or, you know, whatever. The, more recently, I, I like to name it after the original name of the farm or the, or the name of the people that owned the farm when the, when, the, uh, when the tree likely originated. But anyway, some give it a name. So, uh, and then eventually, hopefully, I find the real name and then I can, you know, start using the, the real name. When, when this was really going on full steam was in the, uh, really in the 19th century uh, when, when uh, you know, Maine was just farming like, farming like mad and, uh, and people were uh, planting apples from seed in orchards because it was convenient to carry the seed with you when you came inland or even if you came up the river.
much easier to bring seed than it was to bring, uh, to bring trees. So people brought seed, they planted the seed, the seed produced trees, and then they grafted some of them, the ones that they didn't particularly like, they grafted over to known varieties, varieties that would keep really well, like this one. This is uh, Black Oxford, which uh, originated in Oxford County. There's my poor rendition right there. And uh, this, is, uh, this is a premier storage apple. This will keep all winter into May or June. You can still cook with it in June. That was very highly desirable at back, you know, 150 years ago before Shaw's and Hannaford's had, had been invented. Um, and uh, others uh, like these two, this is, um, this is Pound Sweet and this is Tolman Sweet. And these are sweet apples. They have no acidity. They're very uh, uh, insipid, we say. And uh, so they would taste, uh, they, they not only would, but they do taste weird to our modern palates. And I think they tasted pretty weird to those palates of years ago as well. But, um, but they're very good in certain ways. Uh, one is they, they very good baked. Now, now, I don't mean a pie. They're awful in a pie. They don't, uh, they, they, they're don't. they rubbery and they tasteless. But if you bake them, they're delicious because the sugar in them sort of caramelizes and, and, uh, and the whole skin is just yummy. And um, they're also good for molasses. Um, uh, if you don't have a good uh, access to sugar, then you can uh, take these sweet apples uh, press them into cider, boil down the cider into something like molasses, about that consistency, like you would maple syrup, but more, further. And then it becomes shelf-stable. You have sugar that will last for years. We have sugar. We have molasses in, in gallon jugs, two, three years old. It tastes just as fresh and good as it was the day that we made it from these sweet apples. So, so people discovered these apples, and they... And they they knew they had a value, not necessarily dessert quality. Dessert, a dessert apple is an apple that we eat fresh, like that. That's a dessert apple. Not an apple that you cook into a dessert, but an apple that you eat for dessert. So, uh, or as the English say, with a knife. So, uh, or you could say, with cheese. But anyway, this is a dessert apple, though, and this is another very old variety. This is a variety called Grey Paramain, and uh, we don't know where it originated, but we think it came from Skowhegan. But anyway, this was going all over everywhere, from here to Georgia, out to the Mississippi River. Millions of, millions upon millions of seeds were being planted of apples. Johnny Appleseed was, was a real person. He was just doing what everybody was doing. <laughs> planting apples from seed. And then they were naming them. And so by post-Civil War, maybe there were, nobody knows because many of these varieties were never even written about, but we'll say 15 to 25,000 named American varieties that were just, uh, and each little place had its own collection of favorites. So it was uh, local food in, in in reality, it was really a period of local food. So anyway, so so I would uh, I had these different trees in my yard, and I'd put you know I'd come I'd graft on here, graft on there. So I might have a tree with ten or twelve grafts on the tree of this old variety or that old variety that I would discover someplace that I wanted to save it. I didn't want to lose it, like these trees, you know, that he was talking about there. And so, uh, so the same with Len and his dad. They found this old tree, they took it, they got the sign, would brought it home, grafted it, it grew up into a big tree, and, uh, and they, but they needed a name for it, to somehow to refer to it. And so they called it Alexander, because that's their name, they're the Alexanders. So they thought, okay, we'll call it Alexander. So then um, uh, one year, um, a cooperative extension fellow came to Len's farm, and, uh, and he was uh, being shown around looking at the cattle or whatever. And, uh, and so uh, they were walking all around the farm, and he was commenting on things and, you know, I don't know, giving them a, a, some advice here and there or something. And, uh, and they came to the big apple tree. The, uh, the Alexander. <laughs> 
And, uh, and so uh, uh, the fellow, the cooperative extension agent, looked at the apple tree and he said, wow, that's a beautiful, that's a beautiful tree. And do you know what that is? And Len said, oh, no, we, we don't know. We found it down by the river many, many years ago. We grafted it. He said, he said well, you know what? That's an old Russian variety that was brought over many, many years ago to the United States. And you know what? It's called Alexander. <laughs> <laughs> and that is a true story. <laughs> so what was Alexander anyway? Well, Alexander, uh, some of you might have heard of, uh, of some other varieties for, that actually we, we really associate with Maine, but did come from Russia. One is called Yellow Transparent. Another is Red Astrakhan. Another is Duchess or Duchess of Oldenburg. And, uh, and also Alexander. And, uh, and who was Alexander? Well, at the time that these apples were imported, which was roughly 1835, um, he was the czar of, uh, of Russia. And if you go to Russia fruit exploring, you'll never find the Alexander apple. It's not there. Um, it is there, but it has a different name. It's, uh, and some people say there's different names that it could go by. One is Aporta, A-P-O-R-T-A, and I'm not sure what that means. But anyway, um, it, it, uh, it was imported to the United States with those other apples um, as a way of, uh, of beefing up the sort of hardy genetics of apples in, uh, in New England, because the further you go north in New England, the, uh, the more difficult it was to, uh, to generate good varieties from the seed from Europe. So they needed, they, they needed better genetics. So uh, it was actually the Massachusetts Horticultural Society that imported these four varieties. And, they, and I guess, I don't know whether it was the British or the Americans who made up these names for them because they, you know, they, they didn't want to call them something that no one could pronounce. And so they called one of the other varieties Duchess. Uh, or Duchess of Oldenburg. And that variety, if you've ever been up to Aristic County or have, uh, during apple season in particular, um, every old farm in Aristic County has a Duchess tree. And many of them have, uh, many of them have um, Alexander trees and many have yellow transparent. Red Astrakhan was more popular along the coast and, I, and those of you who, who uh, have more coastal, coastal uh, whatever connections may have heard of Red Astrakhan. But anyway, at one point, and, and duchesses, they're, they're all really, really excellent apples. Uh, Yellow Transparent does, does ripen in uh, mid-August, and they say that if you, you know, go away for the weekend and you come back, they're all going to be on the ground rotten. So uh, you got to use them up quick. But, um, uh, but anyway, um, duchess is a later apple. Still, it's around September 1st. Uh, it's a really, really good pie apple, one of the best of all pie apples. And, uh, but I got curious about Duchess and Alexander, and I started to poke around, try to figure out who were these, who, wh why were they named these names? And, uh, and I sure, I'm sure it must have had something to do with, uh, with releasing them and getting them exported and then imported into the U.S. Because it turns out that Oldenburg, which is in, I guess what you'd say now, northeastern Germany, um, the, the, the Duchess of Oldenburg at the time was Tsar Alexander's sister. And, uh, and so uh, it, it had to have been something going on with, you know, who, who they were trying to please to get these. It might have not had anything to do with the apples either of why they were trying to please these people. But anyway, most, most of the apples that we have here are, are from seed that was brought by Europeans and then some by Russians, brought, brought over to the east and over to the west from both directions. The apple is not native to North America. There are crab apples here that are native, some crab apples, but, but the, the edible apple um, was not part of the Native American diet. Um, it originated, we think, in Kazakhstan, uh, which is uh, on the western border of China, northeast of Afghanistan, in the mountains there. The, the capital of uh, Afghanistan is called Almaty, which means 
father of apples. And, and the trails that the old, the old trading trails that we call uh, the Silk Road went through those mountains where the, uh, where the apples originated or where we think now that the apples originated. And they traveled across Asia in the guts of camels and horses and in the backpacks of traders and so forth. And then, and then deposited them themselves and grew all along these, this web of trading routes and then went around the Black Sea north up through Astrakhan, which is a city in, in, uh, on the Black Sea, and then up into Russia where there is a long, long tradition of, of uh, really super high quality, extremely hardy apples. And then uh, down into Egypt where the pharaohs had orchards and then over into Turkey. Turkey is another area that has a long, long, really, really long rich culture of apples. And then into all parts of Europe. And then we think that it came over uh, probably originally to Maine uh, with the Portuguese fishermen who were fishing off the coast of Maine you know, long before the pilgrims came. But nobody really knows because they were coy about where they were fishing, like maybe some of you are. And, uh, and so uh, they, they were first planted from seed out on the islands off the coast and then eventually inland. And we think that the, uh, that the first orchard in Maine, the oldest orchard in Maine, is appropriately old orchard. And, uh, and um, um, that sort of brings up just the sort of, uh, to me, the sort of fun part of names is that, you know, I had heard of Old Orchard Beach a thousand times and never given it a thought. And then I read an article that said that they thought that, that the orchard there was maybe the oldest on the mainland of North America. Of course, it's long gone. So anyway, they, they, came, they came and they, and they settled. And everywhere they went, as I said, they planted seed, apple seed, started orchards from seed, and then selected the best ones for uh, use in the kitchen and so forth, or in the cider press. And, uh, and then over time, by the middle of the 19th century, there was a, a dramatic shift where people were still planting apples from seed, but for the most part, they were grafting everything. Um, and uh, they, weren't, they weren't having uh, seedling orchards so much anymore. There are still some very old seedlings left in Maine, but, um, but most of them are gone. Um, I was down in uh, Bremen um, a year or two ago and uh, was taken to a saltwater farm where they had seedling trees. And the seedling trees were about this big around. They were probably 45 feet tall and had a crown of 40, 50 feet. These were apple trees growing down in the salt marshes. You know, very, very old, old trees and probably not grafted. There's, um, there's a really beautiful seedling, uh, almost certainly a seedling, in Thomaston. Um, the, uh, if you go through Thomaston going towards Rockland on the, uh, on the water side, there's a sort of a little suburbia that was built maybe 100 years ago or so. And in uh, and, uh, and one of those back streets, there's, a, there's an apple tree that has a spread of probably 60 feet, and it's about 40 feet tall, and has four massive trunks. And they think that that is from uh, General Knox's original cider orchard. And now it's just in a backyard. And so that just, they just chose not to, not to cut it down. But all over the place, there, there, are, there are these old trees. So, um, but, but as the 19th century progressed into the 20th century, the, the, uh, the, the, the alter the, the sort of morphing from the seedling culture to the grafted culture, um, it coincided with a, with a change in farming. So that from the small subsistence diversified farm, we then transitioned into the small, we'll say, uh, diversified commodity farm. And then eventually by around uh, World War I to the commodity farm. And at that point, um, it, it uh, didn't, it, according to the model that we adapted, it didn't make sense to have 
a thousand varieties growing in Maine. And at that point, there probably were a thousand varieties growing in Maine. And as I said, many, many thousands from, from on the eastern part of the US. Um, and so we could, there was a big decision that was made. And that decision was made almost exactly 100 years ago, more like 90 years ago or so. And that decision had to do with, with everything about, uh, we'll say, almost everything about American economic culture. And it was exemplified in the apples. In, in Europe, um, as you know, um, you can go to this town and you get this wine. You go to that town, you get that wine. You go to this town, you get this cheese. And you go, a, I don't know, a few hills away and you get a different kind of cheese and so forth. And, and people actually go to these different places um, to get something different. You know, they don't go to a place to get the same thing. Whereas here in America, we pretty much want the same, or we've been led to believe that we want the same thing wherever we go. So we get, we get uh, if we go to a grocery store and, and we'll, we'll, we'll pick on apples, if we go to a grocery store in, in Portland or in Augusta or in Gardner, we want to get a honey crisp apple. And if we go to Tucson on a business trip or to Michigan to visit our kids, we go to the grocery store and we want honey crisp apple. And they want it everywhere. They, so it's, the, it's a commodity form. Rather than go to Michigan or, or wherever or southern Maine or Virginia and go, you know, this is going to be amazing. I'm going to eat an entirely different group of apples that I've never even heard of before. Instead, there was a, there was an actually a planned and contrived effort to get rid of the old varieties by the thousands and whittle it down to a very small number that could then be thrown into the commodity pot and we could have these big orchards that would produce Max and Cortlands and you know a few others, and um, in Massachusetts, this all this 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 was this meeting, which was uh, a meeting of cooperative extension agents in 1927. Um, this was five years before the last true test winter, and that was the winter of 1933-34. And, um, and in that winter, um, they, uh, there, there was a huge crop of Baldwins that fall. And Baldwin had become the, the number one uh, um, commercial apple of the, about half of the 19th century and much of the early 20th century. And in fact, here's a Baldwin right here. And, um, and it's a beautiful apple. It's an all-purpose apple. It's, uh, it bears gigantic crops. Um, it's from Massachusetts. It was one of these seedlings that somebody just happened to notice and, and gave it a name. And eventually it became incredibly popular. And probably, you know, if you had to pick four American apples or three American apples that would be the most important in the history of American apples, Baldwin would be one of them. And, um, but the Baldwins had a gigantic crop in Maine. That, that fall, and it weakened them because, um, because these, these trees need to recover when they produce a big crop. And, uh, and that November came off extremely cold, and it damaged the trees. And then the winter was one where it became very, very warm, very, very cold, very, very warm, very, very cold. Repeatedly, there were gigantic snowstorms. The coast was frozen for 50 miles. And uh, if, you, if you know Belfast, um, when you go across the bridge towards Sears Port on uh, the Bel big Belfast Bridge, if you look off across the harbor, you see there's a little sort of monument out maybe a quarter mile or half a mile offshore in Belfast Harbor. And one of my neighbors, when I was working on my book, which is about the, the history of the apples in Palermo, um, he was going to high school in Belfast then, which is what a lot of, what a lot of people did, probably some of, maybe some of your parents did, whatever. Um, he went to Bel he lived in Palermo, but went but boarded in, in with a family in Belfast. Went to high school in Belfast, and he told me that during that winter he skated out to that monument, and um, and uh, and when he got out there, he put his hands in the monument and he said to himself, "I know I'm never going to do this ever again," and um, and it killed it killed 
nearly half of the apple trees in New York and New England died that winter. So it was, it was a just unbelievable, hellacious mess. And um, these trees had to be dealt with, plus it just ruined, it, 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 well, it, it altered uh, Maine's uh, orchard industry forever. Um, was that, again? that was the winter of 1933-34. Uh, in the spring of 34 was the first tree pool that was run by the Department of Agriculture in Maine. And they offered two or three varieties, but the primary variety they offered was Macintosh. And Macintosh is a very old variety. Uh, it originated in about 1800, but it was reviled by uh, growers because it um, is very, very scab susceptible. And, uh, and so, uh, if you had an orchard of uh, what we would now call heirlooms, um, most of them did not get scab. But if you brought in the inoculum by, by having a very susceptible variety like Macintosh, you would infect everybody else. And by 1934, they had invented these new fungicides that um, they could spray that would take care of the scab or whatever, kill the scab. And so Macintosh came in at that point and became the, the variety of choice for, and that was where that big transition happened. Meanwhile, all throughout New England, old orchards were being cut down. And there was a few people um, who decided that these old varieties really probably were of some value and that we shouldn't be cutting them down. And uh, there was in particular a man named Lothrop Davenport in uh, Massachusetts who went out systematically collecting old varieties, grafting them into his orchard. And his collection wound up being the, uh, the base for a collection that still exists at a place called Tower Hill Botanic Gardens in Massachusetts. And um, that's a really quite a wonderful arboretum. That's really not a fruit arboretum, but it has this great collection of apples. And, and there were other people, you know, Francis Fenton that I mentioned, who's now 100, there was another guy, Erlen Goodhue, who lives in, uh, he's, he's deceased now, he lived in Sydney. And there were people all over New England, like these people in the North American Fruit Explorers, who, um, who, uh, um, who are out there trying to save this genetic material. One of the, one of the, the, the sort of fortunate um, differences between Maine and Massachusetts, and there are many, but, um, but one of them is that in Massachusetts, the farmland uh, pretty much almost entirely um, was uh, sort of paved over, and became suburbia or became 28 or 495 or whatever. In Maine, as you know, um, for the most part, the farmland was just abandoned. So uh, when I got here in 1968, and when I moved to Palermo in 1972, um, the farms were more or less intact, but, but most of them weren't being operated anymore. There were still three or four dairy farms within a mile of me, but within a few years, they were gone as well. And over the years, we've heard a lot about people lamenting you know, the demise of farming in Maine. But in some ways, it's actually really good that it happened the way it happened. Because since it wasn't sort of paved over, most of it's still here. And, uh, and the same is true of the apple trees. Um, I, I uh, do this type of work all over New England, but you know, 90% or 95% here in Maine. But uh, I've spent a bunch of time in Eastern Massachusetts looking for old trees, and they're very, very difficult to find. Uh, because the roads are wider, and m many of these old trees were right along the road, um, and there's more housing developments, you know, you know the story. Um, and, um, and so people will sometimes say to me, well, so let's say there were a thousand varieties being grown in Maine, which, which there probably were. Now, in Dresden, there were probably 50, maybe, that were grown here, maybe 60. But then if you went you know, up to Chelsea and up to Augusta and over to China and Vassalboro, it would have been some of the same and then different ones. So the, the collections, the assortments would morph as you went from town to town according to who traveled where and according to what grew better where. 
People ask me, how many of them are left? If there was a hundred, if there was a thousand grown in Maine, how many of them are left? And of course, it's impossible to say. Um, and I, sometimes I think that, that there's, there's a, 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 like a fear that, you know, 90% are gone or, you know, 80% are gone or 95% are gone. My guess is that if there were, in fact, a thousand varieties being grown in Maine, and I think that's probably a pretty good guess, I, I bet that 800 of them or 900 of them are still here. And the thing is that, that, that it's, like, uh, it's, like, you know, it's like that apple that Len had that he loved. He wanted a graft. He wanted it in his yard. But he just didn't know what it was. And it was only the miracle where God sent him a cooperative extension agent who knew it was uh, Alexander <laughs> that it ever happened. So, so, um, so I feel like um, my job, and, I'm, and by coming to this, you know that by coming to this talk, you've signed up to be assistants of mine, <laughs> is, to, uh, is to find those old trees, the ones that are hollow, broken down, falling over, now uprooted. Unfortunately, many people lost trees in this last storm. And then, and then notice them. You know, um, when, you're, when your spouse or your friend or your partner or your child is driving and you're not, instead of texting somebody, look out the window and look for old apple trees. And when you see them, then you see one or you go into somebody's yard someday in the back of the woods or you're hunting or you're fishing or canoeing down the Kennebec or something and you see this tree and you go, who was that guy that gave that talk? <laughs> now, so let's get in touch with them. And, uh, because, because this is, you know, for one thing, many of them are disease resistant. For another thing, they have all these great uses. Many of them, many of them um, are not described or as many of them are not written down in any books. Many of them probably are written down, maybe even most of them are written down somewhere in a diary and a journal and a, a, a paper, you know, a sort of a cheap novel or something. Um, this one that I mentioned before, uh, Gray Pear Maine, uh, comes from an orchard, a commercial orchard in, in uh, Fairfield called the Apple Farm. They also own Lakeside Orchard in Manchester. And uh, when they bought the farm, um, they bought it from a man named Royal Wentworth and that was, and, and the current owners are my age, when they bought the farm, they were in their 20s and they didn't know anything about any apple varieties or even how to do it. And so he just told them the names of the apples, and, and then off they went. And one of them that he, that they, that he told them about was Great Pear Maine, and they didn't think anything of it. They just assumed that was correct. So later they told me about it, and, um, and I looked it up, and I couldn't find it anywhere. It was not written down any place. And so I just assumed it was either a made-up name or a synonym for something else or, you know, whatever. Then one day... Um, somebody sent me a citation from a Maine agricultural yearbook, one citation. And in it, it says that uh, a man, uh, a man from, from Skowhegan sent a barrel of gray pear mains to a exposition in New Orleans. And that's the only reference. And it's from Skowhegan. And Skowhegan, as you know, is right next to Fairfield. And, and the apple farm is really on the border of Fairfield, of Skowhegan. So some of them, some of them, um, you know, there are many lists. Um, there are some descriptions. Some of the descriptions are really good. Um, this, are, these two, are very well described. This is this is uh, Northern Spy, um, one of the best of all pie apples, one of the best of all all-purpose apples, one of the best of all keeping apples. A great, it was for a long time a very important commercial apple. This is Blue Pear Maine. This is uh, a great baking apple, another great baking apple, but not a sweet apple. It's a tart apple. These, these and many of these, some of the others I brought today, are very well described in detail. And, and you describe them every, every botanical part. This is the cavity here, and this is the basin here, and so forth and so on. And they're all described. But many of the varieties, many of the local varieties, the descriptions are very poor or just rudimentary. And so um, um, 
and, and there are a few good books. Um, the best is probably one called The Apples of New York, which, is, uh, which was written in about 1905 and has many varieties listed and many good descriptions of those varieties and some color plates. But, um, and, I, and I love my copy of it and, I, and it was a great day when I got my copy many years ago, but it's missing dozens and dozens of varieties that were grown in Maine. So, so um, the answer is sort of, sort of yes, there's lists. There's a book, there's a book that came out I was a uh, doctoral thesis at the University of Maine, in, also in about 1900, which was type, typeset about 20 years ago by a man named George Stilfen and turned into a book, called, and he called it The Apples of Maine. And that fellow in 1910 or so, a guy named Bradford, tried to do an inventory of all the varieties that were being grown in Maine at the time. He also missed dozens. But that's a really good resource. And if you get into uh, um, you know, learning more about the apple varieties that, are, that were grown traditionally in Maine, then uh, this book called The Apples of Maine would be a really important book to have. It does not have good descriptions of the fruit. It has pretty good descriptions of some. It, it has some good um, little anecdotes of this and that. And then it's got some names. It's got a very good collection of names. Um, but it uh, has no graphics at all and no drawings and no, and no uh, color plates. Um, there is a book coming out um, about 10 years ago or so. I was invited to go to a meeting in, in Madison, Wisconsin of Apple enthusiasts. And there was a man there named Dan Bussey. And he was, uh, is a... Uh, a, an appliance salesman in Wisconsin who spent 40 years collecting old books, literature, uh, manuscripts, letters, everything he could that had an Apple description in it and then writing down uh, every single one. And he has amassed between 15 and 20,000 descriptions. Uh, much of this he did before the internet. It, and he, and this, this will be published. Um, and it may be published very soon. There was an article in the New York Times about it about maybe three weeks ago. And um, it's going to be um, about 3,000 pages. And it will have between 15 and 20,000 American varieties in it. And, um, and it will have about 3,000 watercolors of apples in it. And um, the watercolors were done uh, at the USDA in uh, around the turn of the last century, around 1900, from specimens that were sent in all over the U.S. of, of local varieties. And the, um, the watercolors are, are absolutely magnificent. They're the most beautiful paintings or depictions of apples that I've ever seen. So, um, but you can imagine eight volumes and about a thousand pages or 800 pages or something for each volume. So it's going to be pricey. Um, but they, the publisher intends to give a copy to every agricultural library in the United States. So it's just an astronomical job. And I think it will be the most important book ever written in English uh, on apples because it will have a pretty good, a pretty good, um, uh, sort of uh, fairly complete um, list, listing and descriptions of varieties. Still, many of the, many of the varieties are only going to be described uh, very sort of rudimentar rudimental, rudimentarily because, um, because they just didn't write them down. Here, I'm going to read another paragraph from this little article, and then I'm going to finish up, and then, and then I'll take your questions. Also, these old timers will not last forever. And anyone may be the last specimen of its variety alive. As the expression goes, time is of the essence. NAFIX, that's the North American Fruit Explorers, which was this organization, NAFIX might organize a group of collectors to taste very old loners in their area. If the collector cannot graft all the science he collects in the winter, a collection center might be set up to dispense scions to others. When fruit is available, 
specimens could be sent to experts for identification. About 30 years ago or so, we had the first cyanwood exchange here in Maine. And um, it was over in uh, one, of the, one of the buildings near the old hospital in Augusta. And a cyanwood exchange is pretty simple. You bring the twigs, you lay them out on the table, you, hopefully you have the correct tag on them, and then you take whatever you want. And you meet other people that are interested in grafting, and if you've never grafted before, maybe somebody shows you how. And that has now been going on for all these years. Now we do it on the last Sunday of every March in, uh, in Unity at Mafka, uh, last Sunday in the afternoon. And it's all free. You come and take all the sign what you want. And there'll be, there'll be every year, there'll be tables, you know, tables like uh, 15 of these tables in a row, just piled with cyanwood wood from people that bring, bring them from all over the state. These are the twigs. Um, we also then started a little fruit swap in the fall, which, which uh, where you could bring any fruit you want and do the same thing, put it out, let people taste it. Um, in the recent years, we've called that the Great Maine Apple Day, but it started many years ago as just a fruit, just a fruit day in the fall. Then, um, then uh, I was uh, running out of space because I would find these old varieties, and you know I could tell the tree was on its last legs, and I'd bring home some cyanwood, graft it onto one of my trees, and uh, my orchard was really not a commercial orchard; it's really a repository of rare varieties. But I was running out of room. And, uh, and so one of, the, one of the, the last things that Russell Libby did before he died um, uh, was he and I concocted to, uh, to start a orchard at Mafka, a heritage orchard at Mafka. And so um, he had, Mafka had purchased a piece of land that had a really trashed out gravel pit that had been never reclamated and had just been abandoned. And so we decided we would turn the gravel pit into an orchard. And uh, so we, we've put up a uh, fence around it. It's 10 acres. And we uh, have terraced a bunch of it with uh, machinery. And we've planted the first 100 varieties there. And um, these are varieties that were traditionally grown in Maine. And we're hoping, and I think, it'll be, I think we will, that within the next 10 years or so, we'll have, probably have 500 or 600 varieties um, uh, in that orchard. No, this is this is actually this is a this is these are the same apple, um, or the same variety. Um, this is called Mildin or Milding. It has two. Well, many of these had multiple names, you know. And um, for example, Alexander, you know, would have been named, you know. So they got it. They called it Alexander if they had given it to, you know. So these apples change names from town to town and state to state, sort of like folk songs or something. But this is one called uh, Milding or Milden. It originated in New Hampshire. This one was grown in a commercial orchard. This one was grown in a backyard. Um, you can, you maybe you can see the resemblance. They're both what we call oblate, which means flattened like this. Um, they're, both, uh, they, they're both slightly ribbed. I can feel the ribs. You, you might not be able to see them, but I can feel them. Um, and they were a, uh, a keeping apple that was uh, um, uh, passed around, uh, promoted, because it was considerably hardier than Baldwin. So, and this, the, the, sort of, uh, the sort of black spotty stuff on here is something called sooty blotch, which is a fungus um, that attacks apples, but it is, um, although it is unsightly, it's absolutely uh, of no consequence to the health of the tree, to the taste of the fruit, to its longevity, to its keeping, storability, nothing. It doesn't hurt it at all. It just doesn't look good. So anyway, that's, that's mild. These are russets. And if you look at them this way, you can see that the one in my right hand, or maybe you can, is oval and the one in my left hand is round. And, th and that is the way, now if you look at them that way, they're not. But if you look at it that way, they are. This is Roxbury Russet. And Roxbury Russet is, is the classic oval apple from that direction. And um, called irregular. If it was regular, it would be round. Roxbury Russet is probably the oldest uh, American variety, or the oldest named American variety that's still around, and it originated in Roxbury, Massachusetts, which was a, a farming community 
not a city. And, um, and, and it was originally spelled R-O-C-K-S-B-U-R-Y because it was not suitable for row crops. So, so. Um, okay, so, uh, so come up if you have other questions.